my new mission is not to be the greatest angel investor of all time. I want to be the greatest investor in the history of Silicon Valley, which there's probably 50 people in front of me now. But I'm putting it out there right now on this podcast for the first time. I will be the greatest investor, not angel, not venture, investor in the history of Silicon Valley. Hey, friends. Welcome to this week's episode of the HVMN podcast. Angel investing, which is the backing and investing in companies at the earliest stages, is a high-risk, high-reward game. I sit down to talk with one of the best angels in the game today, Jason Calacanis. He's invested in over 150 companies at the earliest stages, including billion-dollar companies like Uber, Robinhood, Thumbtack, and more. We talk about his plans to become the greatest investor in Silicon Valley, the impact of social media and identity politics on conversation and discourse, and techniques for developing a self-aware, self-improving mindset. This is our first podcast in the new studio. Props to my producer, Zill, for all the great work. We have brand new mics and cameras, so I trust you can appreciate the upgraded production value. Lastly, before we get into the podcast, the podcast survey that you've already completed is very helpful for us to understand what we can do to make this show better. We'll be making this an ongoing survey where every month we'll draw a random winner from some of the new submissions, and the winner will receive a three-pack of human ketone. So if you haven't taken the survey yet, head over to go.hvmn.com slash podcast survey, one word, go.human.com slash podcast survey to be entered in this month's giveaway. The link will also be in the show notes. Without further ado, excited to talk to my friend, Jason Calacanis. Jason, great to have you on the program. I know I was in your hot seat last week, so yes. great to have you in our studio. It is my pleasure. Thanks for having me. So a lot of people consider you the GOAT angel, greatest of all time angel investor. It is uh, half true. So what's the edge? I mean, there's a lot of credible people in the area. What do you think is your unique edge here? It's a good question. Uh, I will say that there are three or four angel investors who did really well. Bill Lee, Chris Saka, Ron Conway, uh, ahead of me, but they don't angel invest anymore. Right. So since some of those have retired, I think Ron Conway and Saka are no longer investing. And then Billy has Kraft Ventures and Mark Andreessen has uh, Andreessen Horowitz doesn't. So those two don't angel invest. They put in three, four, five million dollars. So it's sort of like being Kevin Durant when LeBron James leaves the game, he'll be number one by default. And or the Greek freak after that when Kevin Durant goes. So um, I, I bring that up because I want to let people know that I'm serious about what I do as an angel investor. So I will say I'm the goat angel investor or I'm the greatest of, or I'm will be the greatest of all time. The reason I say that is because it's marketing, it's aspirational, um, and it lets my team know exactly what I'm focused on and why their jobs are super important. So some people think it's a little cocky or arrogant, which is great. That's what I'm going for. I want people to understand that I am confident that if I invest in your company, we're going to do great things together and that I can be a game-changing investor. Because if you are the greatest of all time and you aspire to be the greatest of all time, you will attract the greatest. And so people see the work ethic I put in and they see the goals I set. I've changed my goal. It's obvious that I'm one of the top angel investors of all time. And it's I think it's obvious to anybody paying attention that I will be the greatest of all time, uh, hands down. Because Paul Graham, he stopped working three or four years ago at Y right. Combinator. So there's an argument to be made that he's truly the GOAT because... I don't, I mean, maybe they're up to 1,500 or 2,000 investments over there. But the truth is, I think he stopped maybe when they hit 500 or 750. And I think he's been in Europe for the last couple of years yeah. hiding out and enjoying his money. But the truth is, if you put all their investments together, I think it equals 70 to $80 billion in market cap, those companies. You put all mine together, it equals 70 to $80 billion. So right. if you put my track record against Y Combinator, an institution that's deployed, you know, thousand times, maybe 20 times the amount of capital I've done as well as them with 5% of the capital. I've done as well with 150 investments as they've done with 1,500. So yeah. just in terms of efficiency, I'm a machine. 
And which, which is interesting because I think that you clearly have an infrastructure around you. You have the book, the podcast, the conference, and the, the newsletter. I'm building it, yeah, and the university, founded and, that university. But you would see that a lot of these angels that you mentioned will build up, you know, turn into venture capitalists, growth investors, sure. start taking outside money. Yep. Um, and we have yeah. outside money too with our syndicate, jasonsyndicate.com. So why have you chosen the focus? Is, is that a particular strategy? You just re- like are focused on that yes. early, early stage? Yeah, it's a strategy. Okay. And which is kind of interesting because I think that a lot of investors tend to just, uh, just you know, acquire assets under management. Why have you avoided that? Right. It's a strategy because um, there's two ways you can generate amazing wealth and power in Silicon Valley. Uh, there's a small handful. One, uh, you could be a founder and that will get you the most power uh, and the most notability, the most fame uh, and the most money. But you have to hit it a bullseye. You know, you have to build Facebook, Google, Tesla, Airbnb, Dropbox, Uber, Robinhood. I mean, it's a one in a thousand or one in 5,000 chance that you're going to do that, become a unicorn. So that is the most power, the most uh, wealth, um, and the most fame and victory and high fives. After that, uh, being the person who sources the company, the first person, has the most power. They don't have the opportunity to make the most money. Um, the people who are the later stage, so Sequoia's growth, Masayoshi San's growth fund with SoftBank, Yuri Milner, the people who have multi-billion dollar funds, cash on cash, they will make the most money because if Mark Andreessen puts a you know billion dollars into Skype and sells it for you know twice as much, he gets. A billion dollars. 20%, yeah. no, not a billion, but he gets 20 or 30, probably 30% okay. carry, 30% of the billion dollar gain. Right. So he makes 300 million. For me to make 300 million, I've got to hit like three, two or three Ubers. So my job is much harder. However, being the person who sources the deals, finding Henry from, you know, uh, Cafe X in Hong Kong when he was in school or finding Blockable when they had just left Amazon to go make this modular housing company. That's what I do. I find the diamonds in the rough and I bring them through my incubator, syndicate them, build a position of between 6% and 30% of the company. And then I hand them off like a point guard to you know a short list of venture capitalists who I believe are the goats in their category. So Roll off both uh, Chamath, Polyhapatia, David Sachs, Bill Gurley. These are the people that I, when I bring the ball up the court, I give them the alley oop. And so, if you look at Uber, I did the seed. Bill Gurley did the Series A, um, and there's a long list of companies where I incubate them. Uh, Brilliant.org, which has been an incredible company, I handed it off to Chamath and Social Capital. They've done amazing things with it. Cafe X, David Sachs from Craft Ventures, formerly of Yammer and PayPal. He's taken that one on, and he's now done the Series A with me uh, just this week. So I view my job as being the point guard, and I like having massive impact and sourcing the deals and being the first money in. I was the second investor in Thumbtack after Marco's parents, third mm-hmm. investor in Uber early in Robinhood, Wealthfront, Desktop Metal, and Data Stacks, so the six unicorns. And then com.com, you know, you look at that company, they came on my podcast. Nobody would invest in Alex, just except for Michael Acton Smith, who now is the co-CEO. But it was he was having a very hard time. Nobody wanted to invest in a meditation app. We put $378,000 right. in for 8%. People wrote Quora posts, you can look them up. Will Jason lose $400,000 investing in com? That company uh, reportedly, it's in the press, closed money at a $250 million valuation, and they've doubled their revenue since they closed that. There's a rumor going around in the press that they're making $70 to $80 million a year. Who? So, And Not I invested when they had $10,000 a year in revenue. <laughs> and I had my own thesis of why meditation and mindfulness would work, and I had my own thesis on why Alex, too, uh, the co-founder and CEO, um, who really was working on it full-time, was a team of one, um, I had my own thesis on why he would be, you know, a unicorn CEO when people didn't believe in him. I think yeah. they, didn't, they didn't see what I saw. I saw the raw talent. I saw this person was one of the great product minds of our generation, up there with Elon and Steve Jobs. So but other is, people didn't see it, right? So what is that sixth sense? I think I mean when you talk about angel investors, you're often seeing things that are 
you know, ten thousand dollars a month, right? Like yeah. it's, it's barely anything. Ten thousand a year. Ten thousand a year. Okay, even smaller. Yeah. Ten so ten dollars a year for the app. Well, how do you how do you read people? What's that six yeah, cents? Is so, it from poker? I know you're a big poker guy. A lot of it's from poker signaling. I've learned both okay. are very similar. You can tell when people are telling the truth. You can tell when people are lying to themselves. You can tell when they're lying to you. you can, these are different things. Like people can delude themselves or they can outright lie to you and that's fraud. So those are two very different things. I like a delusional person. I like a person who's lying to themselves. To a certain extent, I'm lying to myself saying, my new mission is not to be the greatest angel investor of all time. I want to be the greatest investor in the history of Silicon Valley, which there's probably 50 people in front of me now. But I'm putting it out there right now on this podcast for the first time. I will be the greatest a investor, not angel, not venture, investor in the history of Silicon Valley because I'm not going to stop. And what's the benchmark for you? Like what does it that mean, now. IRR? Just like? Well, no, I would. that's a great question. I mean, it's certainly you have to have the returns. Yeah. I think the number of unicorns that I invest in the first round or, you know, let's say the number of unicorns I invest in at under $30 million and under. Right. Because I could put 10 more unicorns on my angel list page or my portfolio page by just buying secondary shares. Right, right, right. right. So if you want to go buy, I mean, and I know a very famous angel investor, I wouldn't say who, but they literally put Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, and a bunch of other stuff on their angel list page. And they're like, yeah, I just, I bought $10,000 in secondary <laughs> shares on the second market and I put them as angel investments. Right. Um, you know, if you look at the six companies, seven companies I mentioned, six unicorns and Calm, which I think will be a unicorn, I invested in all those companies for a combined value of under 100 million. All seven. The average valuation of those companies, the median valuation would have been 5 million. Yeah. The median would be 5 million. So I'm not fucking around. Like, yeah. I will be the greatest investor in this history of Silicon Valley. And that yeah. means I have to be, you know, that means Sequoia, Doug Leone, you know, Michael Moritz, Ruloff Botha. You know, these are like heavyweights. I mean, yeah. I, I, that's like me saying, I, I'm a rookie in the NBA, I'm Kobe Bryant, and I'm going to be better than Jordan. That's like a big statement that yeah. I'm making today. But that's what I'm going to try to do. I, and if I fail, okay, fine. I'll go from number 100 to number 50. Right. It won't be that bad. I'll be yeah. in the top 50. Yeah. But I'm going for the number one slot because I'm 47, and I'm going to do this for another 10, 20, 30 years. It's completely conceivable. I hit another, you know, six unicorns every six years or a unicorn a year for the next 20. I'll have 26 unicorns. Who has 26 unicorns? Not <laughs> yeah, many. Yeah, what's a diff? Like, how do you get there from, like, what's the difference between you, greatest of all time, investor period, and today, Jason today? Well, I'm going to have to build massive, I need to do many more investments, Okay. have massive infrastructure, and I need to put larger dollar amounts to work, and I need to be on the board of these companies, all of which I've, set up to do it now. Okay. Um, so I'm building the infrastructure, building the team, building the compensation package for those teams. Um, I already have the network. I already have the platform. That doesn't need to get much bigger. Right. Um, and I need to go international, which I've started to do. You may have seen Launch Festival was in Sydney this year right. and will be in Sydney next year. Um, and we'll have some other announcements. My book just got translated into Japanese uh, right, last that. week. Yeah. So I'll be going to Japan on a book tour. It's going to be translated into seven other languages. So it'll be in nine languages. And I'm starting work um, uh, at the end of the summer on my next book. And the first book just had its one year anniversary and has over a thousand five star reviews on Amazon and Audible. So it's a highly rated book. Um, and I wrote it myself. Like yeah. I didn't have a ghostwriter no ghost like some yeah. other famous people here in Silicon Valley yeah. who have books that have done really well. Yeah. But that's the secret. They had ghostwriters and they bought 25,000 copies of their own books through a marketing agency to be a bestseller. I hey, didn't do any of that bullshit. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of like the- It's called cheating. <laughs> or like Hampton Creek or some of these other companies that kind of juice their own wheels. One thing that I think is refreshing with your style is that you actually have swagger. I feel like maybe this is, you know, I've been in Silicon Valley, I guess, including my years at Stanford for a decade. So haven't been- around the rodeo for that long, but it seems that like even in the last nine, 10 years or so, it feels that more and more people are being more cautious. And I feel like you've been one of the rare folks who have been quite outspoken with your opinions and putting yourself out there. Yeah. And also putting it, you know, you're saying, Hey, I'm going to be the greatest investor in Silicon Valley. It's like a big target. Um, I feel like more people should aspire toward that kind of, kind of swagger. I mean, what do you think is the difference? Has an environment changed? What do you think are no, the big drivers? I think people are full of shit, number one. Okay. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of people running around town saying it's not about the money. But, of course, they have all the money. You know, it's like really convenient to say it's not about the money when you have a billion dollars and a jet and 
five houses, right? Oh, it's not about the money. It's like, well, you have the money. So, you know, I grew up, uh, you know, lower middle class. My dad was a bartender. My mom was a nurse. They lost everything when I was 17 years old. Mm -hmm when my dad got behind on his taxes and almost went to jail when they, when the feds came and literally the feds came with raid jackets and shotguns and Whoa. took his bar. Um, but I'm an outsider, you know, like I don't think people really wanted me in this business. There were people who actively fought against me, high profile names in this business who tried to subvert my, you know, ascendance. Um, so I'm a kid from Brooklyn who people didn't want to have, or, or a group of people really didn't want to become an insider. Mm. And then thanks to Uber, um, you know, the other investments are great, but that's the one that really set me apart, obviously. Uh, so thank you, Travis. Uh, I'll always be loyal to Travis and Garrett Camp for that. Um, you know, that got my flywheel started and Sequoia making me the first Sequoia scout. That was what gave me the ability to then do the Uber investment, Thumbtack investment, Datastax investment, and a bunch of other famous investments. So, you know, I've been very blessed to have a supporter in Sequoia, supporter in, you know, the founders of the early companies. Um, but I got here by being candid, by being blunt. And there was a time when people took me aside and was like, you know, you're kind of inside the tent now. You're an insider. You don't need to swing your elbows around, you know, and fight for every rebound. And, you know, when I was a kid, I was the type of kid who would jump into the middle between two six-foot people or when I was 5'5", five, five, and just rip the rebound right out of their hands because I would just sit there in a basketball game and I'd say, okay, the ball's coming off the rim. He's going to get the rebound. And when he goes and brings the ball down to his waist, I'm going to run around the left-hand side and I'm just going to swat it and then I'll steal it. Yeah. And I would just do it over and over again because I was I knew I was at a disadvantage trying to rebound heads up against people taller than me, but I knew they're going to have to bring the ball down to their waist, like which is what they always do, which is so stupid. Um, and then I just rip the ball right out of their hands. So I, I had to be scrappy. Right. It was the only way I was going to get there. So- I am a little more cautious about what I say uh, because it can be misinterpreted. Um, you know, people, Gawker, I mean, uh, said I was a racist because I said, I believe that anybody can aspire to do great things and get there. And, I, and they're like, that's racist. I'm like, I'm sorry, wait a second. I thought that was the American dream. Yeah, that is, yeah. And they're like, no, it's racist because you're a white guy saying, and I was like, okay, well, like, listen, identity politics aside, you know, you're an Asian guy, I'm a white guy. Yeah. Okay, everybody's got an opinion, but if, if we have to frame every discussion through identity politics, it's, I, I think it's just super unfair to everybody that their opinion is being, you know, contextualized based on who they are. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't take into account a person's individual experience, but you can't also not um, give people their own experience. My experience was I fought my way into the industry. So for you to tell me I didn't fight my way into the industry and that I'm an insider and that everything was given to me, well, that's counter to my entire life's experience. It'd be like me sitting across from you and be like, oh, you're Asian, so you're good at math. It's like, <laughs> well, no, I might've sucked at math, but right. you know, like, do I, is the reason you're successful? Did you go to Harvard in the Ivy League? Did you go to school after, you know, like there's this bizarre meme that has spread in the last decade, especially because of social media, that everything, we have to judge everybody by the color of their skin right. and, what, and what they say in context to that, as opposed to their personal experience. Right. And that doesn't mean there's not injustice in the world and- like there's abhorrent things that are happening and it's really scary. Like this racism and Trump and, you know, Ku Klux Klan and there's good people on the other side. But in the dialogue, I think we have to have room for listening to people's opinions before we start judging them based on who they are. Either way, whether it's a white guy, a black guy, an Asian guy, a woman, a trans person, let's just have a calm discussion about what the per person's intent was. And my intent was, look, all the world's information is now online. If there is any skill, name me any three skills that you need in your startup. Um, you know, understanding of biology. Okay. Uh, understanding human performance in elite athletes and military. Okay. Um, and uh, supply chain. How do you manufacture Perfect. that skill? If I went on Google, I'm mean, sorry, YouTube, All right. Coursera, edX, Amazon, Audible. Do you think I would find any books on those or, or courses on those topics? Yeah, you get a good intro, like for Great. sure. Absolutely. Yeah. And how many people do you interview for those jobs who have not taken those free courses on Coursera, edX, 
Khan Academy, et cetera. The majority of them, right? The majority. Right. So the majority of people have staring them in the face courses from MIT and Stanford that are now available for free and they don't take them. Why? We have to ask ourselves this fundamental question. Yeah. Because when, how old are you? 29. Okay, so you remember a time before the internet? Or yes, maybe. vaguely when I was vaguely in elementary you, school. Right. Like the, just when Google the just coming out, I was like, and whoa. You had to get information from? Library. Books. The library. Yeah. You had to go to the library. We had a lot. Nah, and, and your library may or may not have the books. And right. certainly whatever the most important courses were, there were no books. Now, on your phone, high-speed video, you can take a course on machine learning and AI. You could take 20 courses on machine learning and AI. Oh, well, what if I'm not good at math or I'm, I'm not Okay, well, you can take it and get 20% of the knowledge. But if not, you can go to Khan Academy or brilliant.org and you can do whatever math that you didn't get in high school or college. Oh, well, I, I'm even worse than that. I can't even read. Okay, well, now you can go, you know, a step before that. So this idea that people have no agency right? Because we're talking about performance. People have no agency and no ability to change their lot in life is patently false in the age of free education available globally to everybody. Right. If I want to learn how to play guitar, I can download one of five apps and start doing it. I don't have to hire a guitar teacher. It's $100 a year for a musician. I started playing guitar. I'm up to like level seven lead guitar. I bought a new electric guitar. And every week I try to put an hour or two into that. Nice. I, got a, I, I wanted to learn how to play tennis. I literally just put how to hit a tennis ball. I watched four videos. All of a sudden, my friend came over and we were hitting the tennis balls around and he's like, wow, how long have you been playing? I was like, three days. <laughs> like I literally just watched a YouTube video. Yeah. All of the answers are out there. Now it's not, I'm not the person to say this in today's identity politics driven world because I'm a white male of privilege who's made a shit ton of money and is very successful and wrote a book with a, you know, subtitle, how I turned 100,000 into 100 million. I get it. But this is the undeniable truth. Tim Ferriss is out there figuring out performance and telling people every week on his podcast and in his books, here's how to win. Right. But people don't read it. Gary Vaynerchuk is out there. Here's how to dominate social media. Here's how to do marketing. Some people are not watching it. And then we have to ask ourselves, well, if all the information is there, then why are people not consuming it? And if there are more job openings than people looking for jobs, which just happened for the first time in the history of our country, yeah. more job openings than people looking for jobs. What is the disconnect? Well, I did research on it. The disconnect is geography and education and skills, obviously. How about a cultural? Well, now you're going to touch the third rail. Right. So you explain to me culturally or why maybe this isn't happening. Because well, that's the thing, we can't have that discussion. Yeah, we can't have that discussion. We I, can't I, have it. You can't have it as an Asian because people are so <laughs> racist against, Asi against Asians yeah. that you might say something insane like, well, what about motivation? What about the motivation to pick up, uh, to take the AI course? Yeah, well, I think- You want to say it, don't you? But well, you're scared oh, I, well, to say no, it. No, I mean, I think, in, oh, I think Asians are interesting, right? You have, like, we're this, like, weird minority that sometimes gets bucketed into white. And then mm -hmm. the other cases get bucketed into, you know, African-American, black or, or yeah. Latino. And it's just like, we're this weird, yeah, third rail that's like un unmentioned by the p traditional and political discussion. Asians are subject to horrible racism consistently and it's allowed and accepted in society. Asians get beat up constantly. <laughs> Do you know how, I mean, is this true or not true? Yeah, I, I think uh, I agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. And I know, I mean, there's just a great podcast, uh, Still Processing, which is done by Jenna Wortham and another uh, gentleman from the New York Times. It's one of my top three favorite podcasts. I try to listen to podcasts that are by people who are as different from me as possible. Mm -hmm. um, so I listen to Ben Shapiro, yeah, who is a Jewish- Conservative. Conservative, you know, like- you know, has very strong opinions that I don't agree with, but he's very intelligent and I'd like to hear the other side's perspective. Yeah. And then I listen to Jenna Wortham and um, I'm sorry to the the guy who's on the podcast with her, but I believe they're both gay. I know they're both African-American and they both live in New York and Brooklyn where I grew up. And they clue me into, hey, here's what a black lesbian living in Brooklyn deals with, right? Like, 
and how she thinks about Beyonce or cultural appropriation, all this stuff that, or, you know, the Childish Gambino video. This is stuff that I can't, being a white guy from Brooklyn who now lives out here, process. Right. They did a two, and that's why it's a great name for a podcast, still process. they did two episodes on racism directed at Asian people. And this is mm. a, something close to my heart because my wife is Korean. Mm. So I have three daughters who are all Hapa, uh, you know, half, half Asian, Asian, half white, yeah. you know, um, and so I'm, it's amazing to me the racism my wife faces. Like my wife will be being treated horribly by, you know, in a service type situation. Mm. And then I walk up and they're like, oh, sir. What, oh no, of course, whatever you want. <laughs> you know, yes, of course, we'll upgrade you. We'll do this, we'll do that. Yes, oh, late checkout, of course. Like my wife asked for a late checkout. They ignore her. They ignore her. They No, that's not the policy. I walk in, I'm like, hi, uh, I need a late checkout, five o'clock. They're like, oh, let me see if I can do that for you, sir. Oh, we can only do four. I'm like, all right, well, I'm a gold member. I'm platinum. I mean, you know how often I stay here and I've got 20 employees and they stay here. I mean, can't you just give me one more hour? I spend, I just spent $3,000 on this hotel this week. And they're like, oh yes, of course, sir, we'll do that. If my wife tried that, they would be like, <laughs> you know, five foot Asian woman. They would just not give it to her, give her that kind of respect. So anyway, long story short, we're now getting to the point where we have to really start thinking about the two factors um, that I think are holding a large group of people back. One is obviously motivation. And the two is knowing that they that this possibility exists. Yeah. And I think that's kind of the biggest problem. It's one I've been working on with my team. A lot of times people don't believe they could be CEO. They don't believe that they could start a company. There was a time when um, Asian Americans and Indian Americans in Silicon Valley, and this wasn't too long ago, this was maybe 10 years ago, didn't believe that they would, could be CEOs. They believed they could be CTO, they could be the VP of engineering, they could be the number two slot, the number three slot. But my Indian friends would call it the curry ceiling. I'm sure you've heard that. Yeah. Um, and or Asian American- The bamboo American, ceiling. What's that? The bamboo ceiling. For, the for bamboo Asians. ceiling. Yeah. Like, and now I think because you had over the last 30 years, so many senior positions held by Asian Americans and Indian Americans- that it became clear that there was no difference. And then Sundar is running Google and Satya is running Microsoft. It's so obvious, like, you, but the examples had to be there. So now you look at African-American women, Latino women, people of color, trans people, like they're not represented uh, even in those second or third positions. And so that's what we've been working on in our company is trying to move upstream to where people are considering starting companies or maybe working on a project and engage and embrace and provide education and advice in that area. So we started something called founder.university and it's our little hack. We moved upstream. We said, hey, if you're, you've got a product you're working on that's launched or not launched, but you know, you're kind of in beta, come to Founder University for three days, spend three days with me and I'm there for all three days. And we do it six times a year. So it's 18 days in my year. And we do it for underrepresented founders and female founders three out of the six times um, exclusively. And we found all the, the female founders. And we're starting to find the Latino and African-American founders. So all these people who say you can't find them, yeah. well, they're looking in the wrong spot. Yeah, you can't find them with the Series B yet. There, there aren't a bunch in the Series B, but there's a ton in the seed stage. So move upstream a little bit and, and, and look in that area, and I think you'll be pleasantly surprised that there are massive overachievers. Um, right now, I'd say like three or four of the most promising uh, companies we have that are overperforming are led by women. Nice. Yeah, well, and I hope you make a lot of money off of them or, or as, well, they, as I mean, they grow. I, I am very focused on returns. Yeah. You know, like returns give me the, and not just because I need more money. I don't really care about money. I'm, you know, we're sitting here in the same black t-shirts <laughs> wearing the same sneakers and the same jeans. And I've got a cheaper watch than you, you know, like money, who cares? Like right. if we go have a hamburger after this, it tastes the same. Right. If me and Mark Cuban and Elon Musk have a hamburger, it tastes the same. doesn't matter how much money you have, right? It's the same hamburger. And that's what I always tell people, like, you know, like sitting, I mean, there is, an absolute fear of running out of money. Like, so when they do the studies, they show people under- Like 70K a year. 70K a year, which wouldn't be for San Francisco, but for the country. Like once you get past 70K, you start to have the fear and the anxiety and the paralysis that comes from being poor, which I lived with. My parents were poor the whole time and it was 
tension constantly. Yeah. I mean, every fight was over money. There was no fighting about anything but money. If there was going to be a fight, it'd be over, oh my God, are, are we going to make X purchase or Y purchase? And X was the rent and Y was tuition, you know? Was, so I, I understand and I feel people who are going through that level. And, that, and that's another thing we have to do is we have to find a way for people to have enough space for them to take risk. So I've been really looking at trying to find startups now that we've identified for motivation and performance, people need to know that the opportunity exists. They need to see that other people like them can do it and they're not going to be stopped and they cannot be stopped. Um, and um, we need to create a little bit of room for them to be able to engage in this, which could be something as simply as uh, there's a school called Lombada School, Lombada, Lombada School, I think that's how you pronounce it. And I just had the founder, Austin, on my podcast and he's giving free tuition. Hmm. And then he takes a portion of a salary afterwards if they right. get a job. And now he found the impediment for certain groups of people was housing. So now he's providing free housing. Put, I think he puts the cost of the housing into the education and get it back. And then, you know, taking time off from work. So that means you have to put these things on the weekends or nights or whatever. So I feel like the world is trending towards such a beautiful place. But obviously when you watch the media or Twitter, it's just people raging at each other. Yeah. But if you read Steve Pinker's books, uh, Our Better Angels, uh, Enlightenment Now, we're really starting to trend towards poverty going away in our lifetime. Like I'm talking about extreme poverty. And we're seeing extreme opportunity open up. When I was coming up, the idea that a kid from Brooklyn like me could take a course at MIT was laughable with my 71 three-year average. I would never be able to take that course. Now that course is being taken by 10 or 20,000 people per semester. There are 500 people taking it at MIT and, you know, whatever, 50 times that taking it online. Right. The world's getting better. Yeah. No, I think that's interesting. I, I, I hope that it really sounds like you see money as a way to influence the world around you, which I think is a well, very money and power. Yeah, you know, you I, I've given a lot of thought to my own psychology over the yeah. years. So people who are listening to this are probably like, "Oh, fuck, Calacanis!" Like, you know, he said something uh, obnoxious, whatever, right. ten or twenty years ago. Well, people evolve. Yeah, and you know, part of my evolution over the years is realizing that in the victim Olympics and in the suffering Olympics, that you know, I may not be the last person. You know, like. I might actually be two thirds of the way down and there might be a third of people who had it harder than me. Yeah. And it took a while for me to realize that because I had the experience of having to fight and fight to make rent in my $325 apartment. I had to fight to pay my tuition. It took me five years at school. I had to fight to get into investments even later. I had to fight to get my magazine up and running on my credit card. It just Everything felt like a fight to me for decades. So when people try to boil you down as identity politics, you're just kind of like, screw you. Like, well, Yeah, I mean, listen, if people want to, like when Gawker said I was a racist, and now this stuff is still on the internet, and then people are still like, look, Jason's a racist because Gawker said it. I'm like, well, Gawker also like did all yeah. these other horrible things. Like, Take a pause for a second. If you believe I'm a racist because I believe that opportunity exists that has never existed before, well, then we're just intellectually... You're not. You're talking past each other. We're intellectually yeah. talking past each other. Yeah. Now, if you say I can't relate to the experience of an African American woman who grew up in a certain city, I can. At this point in my life, I can say yes, one hundred percent. I might have in my earlier years be like, well, you can't understand what I did, you know. But now it's like it's pretty obvious. Like people have had it harder than me because I've <laughs> seen it, you yeah. know, up close and personal. Like yes, people have hard, have it harder than me. I am not the hardest case. Although that I did feel that way. I had a chip on my shoulder. Felt like I had it really hard um, because it was hard, you know. Like uh, my dad almost went to jail. We lost all, you know. He was in. He was literally had a you know six finger lean against him from the government. It was pretty terrorizing yeah. as a seventeen year old to go through that. But I think we have to like stop talking through each other, stop doing the identity of politics, and start looking into people's hearts and their intent. Let people evolve, let people grow, let people collaborate together, right? And so and have like long form conversations. I think that's why like Ben Shapiro, Jordan Peterson, these intellectual dark book folks are getting such traction. Yeah. I think well, people course. are seeking actual depth and nuance of conversations, and you just can't yeah. have it anymore. I mean, you an Asian American and a white guy talking about the experience of African Americans or poor people, like 
if we tried this on Twitter, <laughs> you, all nuance would be lost. Yeah, people right? be like, you, who and, the hell are you guys talking about this? But if you hear me say, I think I've evolved my position. I've created a product that helps me identify underrepresented founders. It's actually increased the number of underrepresented founders we invest in. And I've learned a lot listening to Jenna Wortham's podcast. And yeah, there were probably some leaks in my logic that I wasn't aware of. Like you'd be like, oh, wow, Jason's a human being. Uh, he's not like a cardboard cutout of some Silicon Valley douche. Right. I mean, I might be a little douchey sometimes. Like <laughs> I own four Teslas. That's kind of, <laughs> that might be a little douchey to own four. It's unnecessary. <laughs> I'm only buying one more. The next Roadster, I'm not buying the semi. Okay. Um, but, I, you know, I, I'm really starting to, I take my position very seriously. One thing that I wanted to bring up, and I think this is, you know, more in line with some of the athletes or military people on this program is it sounds like you have a very focused, or at least in the athletic context, when we talk to athletes, they have a very uh, self-aware approach to improve themselves. Yeah. And it sounds like you've evolved yourself over the years. So what are the key things that you do to self-evaluate, self-reflect sure. and, and manipulate yourself? Sure. Being self-aware is super important. Yeah. There's a lot of different ways to get there. I mean, some people go to therapy. Some people have close friends who they have blunt conversations with. Some people take psychedelics. I mean, people do all kinds of different things to try to be self-aware. I have surrounded myself with people who tell me the truth and who I tell the truth to and have candid discussions with. And I'm very lucky that these are some of the most successful people in the world. So, you know, I can sit at my poker game with Phil Helmuth, the greatest poker player in the world, and he can evaluate me as a poker player, but also as a human in my game. And I've evaluated Phil. And Phil and I have had a cantankerous relationship at times, but we also have a very loving relationship. Where we put our arms around each other and say we love each other as two grown men, and we do. I love Phil Helmuth, like he's one of my favorite people. But we've also had just crazy fights and arguments and madness. So if you can surround yourself with truth tellers, Chamath is going through a rough time right now in social capital. Mm -hmm. And he's also been on top of the world. I've gone through rough patches where he's given me advice. Our friend Dave Goldberg, who passed away tragically three years ago, two and a half years ago now, um, you know, he was always like this great voice of reason who would pull me aside and say like, yeah, you, you, you're you, right about this. You might be wrong in the way you're delivering it. He was like this great truth teller to Chamath, to myself, to Phil. Um, and so I think if you surround yourself with truth tellers and people who are honest and candid with you, they'll tell you the leaks in your game. Because in poker, we will pull each other aside if we're friends and say, you know, I watched you, how you played that hand. It was pretty obvious what you had. And, and here's how you might play differently in the future, right? Well, you can also do that in life. You just have to be, you have to ask people to be candid with you. And so I've done that with my team. I've asked my team to be candid with me. I'm candid with them. And you have to, I use the word candid, which I got from uh, Ed Catmull in a really good book called Creativity, where he didn't ask people to be honest with him about why Toy Story 2 sucks or doesn't. He said, be, let's be candid about this plot point or this character. When you say be honest, his position was at Pixar, you're saying you're not being honest, so now start being honest. When he says being candid, he can say, you're being honest, but now I want you to be even a little bit more raw in your feedback. So I think asking people to be candid with you is just this magical gift. And then also I have haters because I'm so active on Twitter and other places. And people are like, we'll get in the comments on YouTube and be like, you're talking over the guest, you know, let the guest finish or you're talking, you know, whatever. And I'm like, yeah, you know, that is a habit of mine. I, you know, talk a little too much or whatever. Could be a leak in my game. Sometimes it works really well in an interview, like in this right. case where you're interviewing me. Sometimes if I'm talking over a guest who has something to say, it could hurt the interview. Right. So I love my haters. In fact, internally, we call them jaders with a J. Okay. And we all just, the jaders make you better. Yeah. Because typically when somebody is criticizing me, you know, anonymously on Twitter or on YouTube, they're like, they're you honest. fat fuck, <laughs> you talk with a lisp and you're losing your hair and you look like you haven't slept. Uh, and I think you're talking over the guest a little bit too much. Let them finish. Uh, by the way, did I mention you're a fat fucking piece of shit? Blah, 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 blah. And then like, so it's usually like the sandwich of like, hate, 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 hate. Some very valid, insightful criticism. And then hate, hate, hate. And what you have to do is have a thick skin and say, okay, this is an anonymous troll who's in their mom's basement eating fish sticks, 
who maybe is a little jealous of where you got in life, whatever, or they're just a hater, or they're just a troll having fun, or it's one of your friends breaking your balls and chops right. with, you know, like at a poker table. But anyway, just let all the personal hate go away and just look at that corner stone. So when Gawker said, oh, you're a racist, I was like, why are they saying that? I don't get it. And then I talked to some of my friends who are in certain groups and they said, well, here's here might be why they're saying that. It, you come across as clueless because you actually think you had it as hard as other people. And I was like, oh, is that actually the reason? And my wife was like, yeah, that's the reason. Like, you think that you had it hardest. Do you think there's anybody who had it harder than you? So when my wife did that in my book, I talk about how hard I had it and I wanted to share my story. And then I put, she said, yeah, but you don't mention the other people. And I said, well, it's my book. HarperCollins paying me right. for my book. And I'm paying for other people's stories. She's like, yeah, but remember we talked about being clueless and maybe not thinking. And I, and I rewrote that chapter. And at the end of the chapter, I said, listen, and I said it in my own words, but my wife, you know, read and gave me some really good edits on it. And I said, as much as I feel I'm an outsider, I'm paraphrasing myself, I recognize that there are people who didn't have a dad who bought them a thousand dollar computer. And there are people who didn't have two parents and owned their home, barely. And there are people who maybe, you know, had this more difficult or that more difficult. And that for those people, I salute them and I'm rooting for them, right? And I understand that even though I felt it was really hard objectively, it wasn't. And because you know what? I look at these trust fund kids and they would say stuff to me like, yeah, my dad is like really on my ass. And if I don't go to like get my law degree, he's, you know, he's not, not going to get my trust money, fund. Right? He's not going to release it. And I, I wanted to choke these kids when I was in college. I was like, you have a trust fund? What is that? They're like, soft. Yeah. They're like, well, I get like, I mean, it's not like a big deal. I get like 3000 a month. I was like, you get 3000 a month. What do you have to do? Like, I, I'm making 3000 a month, like fixing laser printers under desks. It's like, what do you have to do for 3000 a month? No, nothing. I just get 3000 a month because it's a million dollar thing and there's 50000 in interest. So they just give me the interest or half the interest I get in a payment every quarter. And then there's a trust I have to ask. And if I want to do it, but he really wants me to be a lawyer. And I was like, go to law school for free. You can go to, he'll pay for it. Do it. Your mom and dad will pay for law school. I hated those kids. Now I look at it and I'm, I have some sympathy for them. I'm like, oh, your dad used money and your parents used money to manipulate you to, you know, have your adult life be what they wanted it to be, not what you wanted it to be. And you had to sacrifice those years. Like I can actually have sympathy for a trust fund kid now, mm. which I could never have sympathy for a trust fund kid. I want to punch those kids in the face. Right. I was so jealous of them, right? Or Asian Americans, like, you know, this whole tiger mom concept, which people, uh, did you have parents who were, Super pro education who just yeah, pushed I think you that's, I think that's harder. in the Chinese culture. Yeah. Um, but but think, do you resent them for it or do you laud them for it? Because I wish I had parents who pushed me harder. Yeah. And then I talk to my wife and people in our family and then people in our extended circle. And I'm exposed to just a lot more Asian American culture. And it's le it leads to a lot of depression and anxiety in right. Asian Americans that people don't actually give them credit for. Right. Like. Do you, do you have anxiety and did you suffer from anxiety and stress from the pressure put under you by, you know, having a tiger mom or dad? Um, I think that's a good question. I think well, I was I fairly rebellious. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I just kind of like, I remember just like getting a big fights in sort of middle school, early high school, where I think the lessons were just embedded in me, where it, it became instead of a extrinsic, you know, a, I guess, focus on achievement, it became very intrinsic. And then like kind of like the noise of getting badgered was annoying. So I think it worked long-term right. in terms of like having aspirations of a strong work ethic, valuing education. Um, but it was definitely tumultuous in terms of right. uh, sort of like, I guess the more American, independent, free spirit of, of yeah. what I think is good about American culture. But they based their love for you Yeah on your engagement in academics. Absolutely. And you yeah. felt that. Yeah. So you felt you would get less love from your parents if you were not as academically inclined and you would get more love if you had more engagement in academics, correct or not? <sighs> I mean, I think there was pressure, but I don't think it was based on 
uh, rescinding or giving love. I okay. think I think I was made very clearly. Like I think p- my parents were always very supportive. Ah. but clearly because I've you know, heard that push. sometimes like love, like you are not going to be part of yeah. this family, or we will we do not love you if you do not. Excel. No, I've had Korean friends who like yeah. would get like the belt on, you know, get they would literally flat. get hit. Yeah, and this is in the nineties. Yeah. yeah, this yeah. is not in the sixties or fifties. Right. We're talking about in the nineties. Yeah, they would be whipped with a belt. Yeah, if, if they didn't get in, perfect math scores. Yeah, or they'd be, be like, scores. "Whoa, like my parents are pretty hardcore, but not that hardcore." Yeah, yeah. So that's interesting. Like everybody has different experiences, yeah. and I think that's one of the things that. Have you read uh, Thomas Sowell's uh, "Black Rednecks, White Liberals"? No. It's Good. an interesting discussion on culture and, and how different you know minority groups and yeah uh, have evolved I've tried to educate myself. Yeah. You know, I read Hillbilly Eulogy, and you know, I try to listen to media and read books that just are not going to be in my natural wheelhouse. Yeah, like Charlemagne the Gods book, <laughs> you know, like from yeah. the Breakfast Club, and I listen to the Breakfast Club once in a while. You know, like the interviews and stuff. Just try to expand my consciousness beyond. Do you, you think know. that's one of your edges? It seems like you put yourself out there for critique and like put yourself out in their culture. And I think that helps you learn faster than other people, perhaps. Do you think that's part of the edge? I mean, it sounds like, you know, I, you can imagine that you have your rich friends who are just like, I'm rich now. I'm going to be on my yacht. I'm going to be with only my rich you friends. You know, people do tell me, right? shut up. They're just they like, just yeah. insulate out. And I think that probably yeah. gets them complacent and weak where I think I you think it does make edge. you weak. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I like to keep writing. I like to keep having my opinion. And... For better or worse, because I've examined my own psychology and a lot of my psychology and my motivation came from being poor and not having power and living in a harsh environment where being poor and weak and not powerful was pointed out to you and was a risk, you know, when you grow up in Brooklyn. So literally our pastime in Brooklyn was to make fun of each other. Right. Like this literally was the pastime was to sit there and, and bust whatever, each other's balls. Bust each other's chops. Yeah. And, you know, like whatever was the thing that was the most sensitive to a kid in Brooklyn was the thing that all the other kids would uh, key on. So there was a, a couple got divorced on our block. And that's all we did for a year was make fun of the kids whose parents got divorced. I look back on it and think, <laughs> Damn, we brutal. were insane, <laughs> evil little creatures, but yeah. it was equal opportunity because yeah. they would look and say, your dad's an alcoholic, your dad, your mom's fat, your your parents are getting divorced, you're poor, you, you're wearing your brother's sneakers with holes in so them. Like thick skin growing up. I mean, yeah. a thick skin would be like an understatement. You had to psychologically be prepared to be interrogated. So if you got your haircut, we'd be like, oh, would you get, oh, you got your haircut? Oh, where'd you get it done? And be like, oh, I went to Astro Place. We're like, okay, good, because we're going to go there and kick that guy's ass after. I'm not going <laughs> to let him do that to your hair like that. We'll go, we'll, we'll go beat the shit out of that guy for doing that to you. It was literally every step along the way. So I think when people are like, Gawker calls me a racist, I'm like, I don't care yeah. that some loser kid at Gawker wants to, you know, say this bullshit. Like, I, for better or worse, am, dr- am immune to criticism. And that has led to blind spots for me. It has also led to the fact that I just keep forging ahead with a with a samurai armor on me that just stuff bounces off of. Yeah. But of course, you know, anybody with that samurai armor, you have to take the armor off sometime and right. you have to be able to have a downtime where you feel loved and safe. And so I have my family and I have my friends. I can take my armor off. I can be safe, you know? And I think Phil Helmuth and I also have both of that thing where both have to be on guard. Right. You know, he's the world's greatest poker player. He's getting attacked constantly at the poker table. Right. And then sometimes he wants to take his armor off and feel safe. And like, yeah, he's a samurai warrior, but it's the, the armor is heavy. Yeah. Right. And I think being a founder of a company or a high profile person, you have to have this armor up all the time. And you you're and then with social media, it's become a hundred X. Yeah. You know, Elon's trying to save the world from climate change and global warming. Yeah, I've been and, seeing this Tesla stuff on Twitter. And they're what attacking you, yeah, him. What do you and think of all this? it's just like, I think Twitter is, I didn't invest in Twitter. It was a $50 million, 25 to $50 million mistake. And the reason I didn't want to invest in Twitter was because I thought it was going to be a cacophony of idiots hmm. because you didn't write blog posts because I was a snob because I was a good, I am a good writer. I'm a great writer. And I was like, if you want to write and you want me to read what you have to say, write three paragraphs, do a blog post, 500 words, I'll read it. But if you want to write a sentence or two and a couple of fragments, no, I'm, I don't care what your opinion is. Right. If 
write a thought out piece, write a thousand words. I'll read that. Um, because I came from the blogging era that Twitter replaced. Right. Or largely replaced. Blogging went away because Twitter is just so instantaneous. You're still super active on Twitter. I am. And I'm announcing today that I'm giving it up for no, the next not. 30 days. Really? I am. I'm dead serious. I'm deleting it from my phone. Um, because. Whoa. It's becoming <laughs> such a distraction for me, and I want to write the next book. And I deleted it off my phone for six months, and I wrote the last book. So oh, I wow. want to get the next book done. It's been a year since the last one came out. I want to spend this year doing it, so I have a book come out every other year or something. And I have like two great books in me that I want to write, and I've been writing notes on both. And I'm going to make a decision by the end of the summer which one I'm going to go with. Um, so you really put your money toward where your mouth's at in terms of like morality or ethics. I mean, I was on Wikipedia. I was like, yeah, like Jason pulled all your Facebook. You sold all your Facebook shares because you weren't happy with. Yeah, I don't want to own were. Facebook. I kind of feel like that company's, company's amoral. Um, I feel like every decision they make is in the best interest of reducing friction to make more money, not mm -hmm. in thinking about our society. So like Twitter was like, you know what, Milo Yiannopoulos, you're a troll. You're ruining the system for everybody. This is a private place. You're banned for life. Right. We, we can't have you on here causing a mob of people to attack, you know, celebrities who are the core of the service. We're just going to make a decision. And then you look at Zuckerberg and he's like, yeah, info wars and Holocaust deniers and yeah, they're misguided and I'm going to kind of steer them, you know, in the right direction and we can work with them. It's like, you have not been paying attention. Like the only way to work with a Nazi is to kill a Nazi. Right, like this is the level of insanity we've become in our society, is where people are like, "Yeah, we need to be tolerant of Nazis." No, you need to punch a Nazi. Right. You know, like if somebody wants to come up and spew some Nazi bullshit to me, like it's going down. Period. Like I'm not having it. <laughs> like we have to go back to that America where if people really want to be racist pieces of garbage and they want to espouse Nazi nonsense, like not on my platform. So if you want to have info wars and you want to say the Sandy Hook parents were in on a conspiracy like a to have murder their own children. Yeah. You know, that's just a bridge too far. And Z I, mean, I understand Zuckerberg's point. I'm, I am for free speech, but I am also for people who want to say racist, Nazi, crazy stuff. They don't have to be on your platform. This is not a big, brave decision. Right. You know, like, yes, the Ku Klux Klan, the ACLU will fight for them to march down Main Street. Okay. Good, we know where they are. That doesn't mean the New York Times has to give the Ku Klux Klan an, an ad yeah. and an equal platform. It's the New York Times' platform. And Zuckerberg's a coward, and he only cares about money, and he only cares about the share price, and he's always thought this way. And if you think that his position has changed over the years, it hasn't. He said, these idiots are giving me their information. They're stupid fuckers. Like, that's the transcript of his I am. You ever see it? Yeah. That is that was his position as a child, yeah. and that is his position as a man child. He hasn't evolved. I don't believe he's evolved. I mean, if he wants to sit down and have a cup of coffee with me, I'll sit with him and see for myself yeah. if he's evolved. I don't believe his behavior shows an evolution in any way. He allowed the Russians to buy racist ads on his platform in rubles. That, in all likelihood, led to some number of people not coming out to vote in the election. He did this because he doesn't want to review ads. And he doesn't want to eliminate ads in the system. He wants to make money. Right. If you put an ad in with a link to an affiliate network on Amazon or a dating site, you will not get it through. Why? Because that affects their bottom You're line. Taking money off the platform. Taking yeah. money off the platform. Yeah. But if you put racist ads up against Hillary Clinton to try to get African Americans in swing states to not come out for Hillary, he'll let that go through. Hmm. That tells you everything you need to know. He does not care. And if you look at what he did with groups, are you a member of any groups on Facebook? Yeah. We have one of the largest intermittent fasting groups, We Fast. Perfect. Yeah. Have you been added to groups when you go to the group page that you didn't add yourself to? Yeah. People do like our People have added you to yeah, groups. Yeah, yeah. The number one reason group systems did not flourish was because you, ha um, you had to convince people to join them. Mm hmm. So somebody at Facebook came up with a killer idea. Put a box on the top right where you put in people's email addresses invite and their friends, names yeah. and you invite them. Yeah. But you're not inviting them to join because that's friction. You're joining them. Right. You're making the decision for them. Right. Well, Zuckerberg did this and a group of gay men who were in college, it's a story you can search for, 
on Google, and you'll find it very easily on Google News, were added to a gay men's choir in their college. Mm. It then posted that on their walls. Their parents saw it. Out at everyone. Their parents didn't know their kids were gay. Yeah. Can you imagine the pain and suffering Zuckerberg caused in that instance? That's what he does over and over again. He looks at that, and his response to that was, well, maybe you should have different friends. Hmm. That's Zuckerberg's bizarre approach. Now, either he's clueless socially, which is a group of people believe he is clueless on a social basis, or you can believe that he is for removing friction and is obsessed with the growth of his company and move fast and break things. So in the evidence pile, and just on a logic game theory breaking this down, either he's socially inept or he's obsessed with growth to the point of not caring about the ramifications. But, or, I, think, I, but I think he's realizing that he's going to get bucketed here and he's going to get regulated. So I think yeah. in his self-preservation, I think he seems to be doing the right like lip service at least. It's always been lip service. He says it every time. Okay. And nothing changes. And nothing will change. Nothing will change. But I think his self-preservation instinct will carry him through. Like I, I think, I, I, I think, think he's, he's no. smart, right? You don't think you uh, think he's still gonna be amoral, or just run the I platform. I think an a, a, the amoral way of running the platform means you win. And I think for someone like him, it's a video game hmm. of how big can it get, and how do I get everybody on the planet on my platform? It's a giant video game, and he is heads down. There is but not a, an existential risk when government's like, okay, we're gonna start banning you. Maybe, but if you look, he got pulled in front of all these courts, right? And what happened? You talked, it was Ray. I mean, the, the okay, regulators what's are, the ramification yeah. been? What's Nothing. happened since Nothing. that time? I mean, stock has gone up. The stock has gone up. Yeah. So if the scoreboard is the stock and the usage of the product, he keeps winning, he's going to keep the same behavior. Yeah. I think he learned the wrong lesson, which is he can dodge bullets. He's he's mm. learned that he's like Nemo. Is it Nemo in the Matrix? Neo? He's like yeah. Neo in the Matrix. He yeah. can literally slow down time, dodge the bullets, and get right back up. He's learned the wrong message. The only way this stops is if the EU or another country bans Facebook mm. or levels fines that would be so large that they would be a deterrent. But I mean, the biggest fines were five billion for just Google, now for Google right. for the Android and then two billion before that for shopping. So seven billion for a 700, 800, 900 billion dollar company yeah. is laughable. Right. They're laughing. They're like, for the love of God, let's preserve this system right. where you fine us a fraction. And they'll still litigate it for a, a bunch more years. Anyways. Exactly. Just yeah. please create this system where I get charged a fraction. Of yeah. it. And it's not that I dislike Zuckerberg personally. I mean, I, I don't want to make it too personal. And I did at one point say he had an Asperger's-like approach to product design. And I realized, and, and I, I felt bad about that because I'm not a psychologist. This is like when you're sort of talking about evolving. Right. Like I thought that was a leak in my game. I would make things a little too personal. And I've tried to refine my way of presenting myself to not make it personal. Unless it's about me, I'll be very personal about myself. But I try to make it not too personal. And I, I was watching Saturday Night Live. I don't know if you saw the skit where they had him on the weekend update on the news. Didn't catch that. They literally made him into somebody suffering from like clinical Asperger's. Where right. he's like, make eye contact, laugh, <laughs> ha, ha, ha. Now- Continue to eye contact, right. connect with the person. Like they were literally treating him as if he was on the spectrum to a level of dysfunction, which I thought was actually cruel um, and unnecessary. I think, you know, he's going to have to live with himself. And, you know, all the money in the world, um, if you have to go to bed at night and think, God, I'm the hated, most hated person on the planet and wake up that way, it's not worth it. Right. It's not worth it. And I think Bill but Gates. Do, but do you think he thinks like that? I mean, oh, I, don't, I like, do you think, think like what do you think is in Trump's head? Like when he goes to bed, right? Like I think well, some that's of these a people, whole different ball right, of wax. But I think some I of these mean, people are just very much in their yeah, own universe. I think you're, yeah, like there's sociopathic behavior, um, which you know I I, I I wouldn't even begin to know how to diagnose Donald Trump. Right. How much of it's an act, and how much of it is just derangement? <laughs> He's neo. How much of it's corrupt? I mean, yeah. I, it's very hard to understand that yeah. one. But for Zuckerberg, I can tell you it's very similar to Bill Gates, I think, where Bill Gates was, remember when Bill Gates was hated because Microsoft was a monopoly yeah, and taking over the world? Yeah, I seeing that. And it was very personal. It was very vindictive. Like people were really like his competitors. They really attacked him. And he, they have that deposition tape where he's getting upset and right. he's like, comes across very poorly. And then I think it kind of crushed his entrepreneurial spirit and he mm. left Microsoft. They did like the goodbye video with him with his box leaving. And then he went and took all his money and now he's going to 
solve malaria and other diseases. Toilets, and yeah. he's, he's literally going to get rid of poverty in the world. Yeah. So I think a lot of that motivation came from being so hated huh. in the public sphere. Right. So I think that for Zuckerberg, he really needs to take that big pile of cash he has and go put it to use and make up for the chaos he's caused in the world. Yeah. Like if I was him, I would literally start giving away billions of dollars as quickly as possible to make people feel good about it. Like this, I think he did the um, hospital here, the right. Zuckerberg Chan yeah. hospital. Yeah. And yeah. then I think Benioff also did it. Right. We went there uh, when we were having our baby. It's an incredible place. So I, I give him, I judge him. Um, and I think we should judge people. I mean, I think this idea, actions, like, don't judge right, people. I judge right. people on their actions. I think his actions as a corporate executive have been terrible, horrible, except for shareholders. And I think, you know, his wife's, you know, donations to charity, which I think she leads, have been exceptional. So, I mean, more Chan, less Zuck. <laughs> yeah, giving credit where credit's due. Yeah. So I want to move on to some audience questions. So Christine oh asks, well, Here I don't we think these are too tough. I mean, she okay. asked like a Peter Thiel kind of question. So what do you believe that no one else believes? I believe anybody can accomplish anything. And no one else believes that? I think few people believe that. And I think fewer people are believing. I believe America is the greatest country in the world. Okay. Um, I still believe it. I don't think that's people believe that. I believe that the world is getting better, not worse. I think there's a small cohort of people who believe that. I think most people do not. Mm -hmm. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. I believe I'm, people change. Yeah. I don't know if most people believe that. Hopefully Zuckerberg can change. Yeah. yeah. If Zuckerberg is listening, which he's not. Yeah. I believe you can change. Get yourself a group of friends who are candid with you. Yeah. I don't think he has, I don't think he maintains friendships with the people who are candid with him. So the people like Sean Parker, Chamath, Dave Morin. His original. Who are critical, right. his original team, who are yeah. critical of him. I don't think he's friends with them. I think he's friends with the sycophants, mm. you know, and the people who tell him he's right and that he's a god. You know, listen, I appreciate what he's built. Any entrepreneur who can build something that big deserves some level of kudos. Right. It's, it's not people are like, oh, you're jealous. I'm like, I'm rich. I'm not jealous at all. Right. I've got a lot of friends. I maintain friendships for decades. Like the my, I'm literally having my first employee from New York in 2000. One or two, no, I'm sorry, 91 or 92, bringing his family by my house for a barbecue tomorrow. And we haven't seen each other in 20 years. Like I'd literally maintained friendships for decades and have like incredible goodwill. I'm not jealous about him. I just don't like the way he runs the business. Two different things, right? you know? Fair um, enough. But anyway, so I, I'd say, I believe anybody who's being capable of, of anything um, is the thing that most people don't believe, and that is absolutely true. What do you think of, I mean, I was riffing off of, uh, sort of, I guess, the bearishness, perhaps, of America. I mean, I think, I'm curious how you size up China and, and how their system of capitalism is comparing against America. This is something I've been thinking about recently, where in America you have our best entrepreneurs like Bezos or Elon Musk getting sort of Hated on, mm -hmm. uh, or you have you know the president sort of hitting it's a on, pendulum. on on it. Yeah. But in China, they're basically backing like these. Yeah, like their winners are getting backed by government subsidies and government monopoly. You know. Yeah, well, because the government there is smart. They realize that the competition isn't between the citizens of China. It's, it's between the, the countries. Yeah. And so here we're infighting, which is what Putin has basically done. This huge yeah. campaign to do is to turn us against each other. Yeah. And they're turned us against each other on the two like issues that will never be resolved: guns and abortion. Like yeah. literally, we're we're our whole country is fighting over these two key issues that could be solved very simply. Let the states decide, make them not federal issues. If we're never going to resolve them, so if you want to make California a gun-free or like gun registration light zone where like everybody can own one gun mm -hmm. and only these types of guns, fine. And then if you want to own a bunch of guns, move to the state next door. And in right. Nevada, if they want it to be a free-for-all, fine. But if you cross the borders, you got to behave. And if, you know, the number of weeks when a pregnancy can be terminated is up for massive debate, we can have different states have, and they do, we can have different rules around that. Right. Uh, and then we can get back to focusing on America winning um, and what that looks like. But, you know, you have to remember, China is just developing its middle class. If you're a journalist and you criticize anyone, you'll wind up in jail. If you want to practice a religion and criticize your local government, you will be murdered. Right. So, you know, 
we are a much better country than them. People can sit here and criticize the president. They could make a big blow up baby doll of the president in London and right. do that. Like you can't capitalism you can't is important. Yeah. It's not as important as democracy. Capitalism is in is a great you know um, you know add on to democracy, and you have to really know how to nurture it. But communism plus capitalism is not the ideal. Right. What you want is compassionate capitalism combined with democracy. So my fear is that if you have governments start backing like just game changing technology like like AI. general AI. Yeah. Or Good you luck. just have Good luck. You can only yeah, put it, we'll see that experiment. Putting happen. a gun to people's head and saying do work is not as good as the intrinsic. So to your point before right. about intrinsic versus extrinsic, right. like yeah, you can beat people into doing things and there have been, you know, Olympics that have been won by communist countries that right. will beat their own Olympians. Like they would torture yeah, yeah, yeah. Olympians if they yeah. didn't win in certain countries. But I mean, uh, that's not yeah, that's I mean, not a long term strategy. To be run in the right, next that's short term. Years. Yeah. That, you know, external motivation is short term, internal is long term. Yeah. America's got an internal motivation where yeah. people here feel they can change the world. This is why it's important for all citizens in America to feel that way. You know, the Latino girl growing up in LA, African American, lesbian in Brooklyn, any the, everybody should feel they can change the world here. And that's the big tragedy I think has to be resolved yeah. here is that not everybody feels that they can live the American dream because they're getting pulled over for driving while black. Or I don't know if you saw the video today of somebody selling gourmet lemonade in the mission. And somebody called the cops on them for- Like the permit patty types. The permit patty right, things. Right, right. And it's like, who are these moronic idiots <laughs> who are like, if a little girl wants to do a lemonade stand or sell bottles of water and learn capitalism, let's go. Yeah. Rock and roll. Yeah. But they don't have a permit? Really? Girl Scout cookies are going to need permits? Selling lemonade stands going to need a permit? Yes. And you, who has the time for this? What bitter, you know- Anger, self-loathing, do you have in your soul that you're gonna stop people from having a barbecue? You're just sad that nobody invited you to a barbecue. That's what you when I look at those peppermint patties, yeah. permit patty, you know, people, I'm just like, oh, don't you get it? They're not experiencing love in their life. Right. No, they have no friends. Nobody invited them to a barbecue. They just want to sit down and laugh and have fun at the barbecue. Well, that's what America's supposed to be about. Yeah. When permit patty shows up. You know, we need to say to Permit Patty, like, oh, did you want to join the barbecue? Why don't you go pick up some lemonade and we'll get the, you know, the burgers and somebody else get the charcoal and let's all have a barbecue together. Yeah, that's, that's what America's America. about. Yeah. That's what we need. Yeah. It's people who are different celebrating and being Americans together. I think actually that's going to be the end game. I think we're going to get out of this Trump era this Russian collusion, all this madness. And at some point, people are just going to be like, you know what? Fighting over guns and abortion and all this stuff is just exhausting. Yeah. And they just delete Twitter. Or they delete the social media stuff, Facebook. And they just go have, in my ideal world, a picnic. <laughs> you know, if we're all sitting around having a picnic, we could discuss these issues. Yeah. But reaching across the island, you know, they had the kid Ben Shapiro on- um, that show, um, Politically Incorrect, no. What, what's Bill the Maher? Bill Maher. Maher, yeah. It used to be Politically Incorrect. I don't know, I think it's the Bill Maher show, yeah, whatever yeah, it is yeah. now on HBO. And like, they were trying to goat him into, you know, like a Twitter-like fight. Right, they're trying to troll him, basically. Yeah, yeah. They, and they were trying to make it seem like they had really divergent opinions. It wasn't that divergent. And that's right. what you find, is you take somebody like Ben Shapiro and then you take my friend Sam Harris, and then you put the two circles on top of each other. One's an atheist, one's like a devout Jew, and they're really not that different. Right. Like, yeah, one believes in religion, one believes religion's like a virus. But other than that, they can they can have a civil discussion. Why can't we have civil discussions anymore? Why do we have to paint everybody as being on one side or the other? Most people are right down the middle, right? Most people are reasonable. Right. You know, people in the South are not anti-gay to the extent people want to paint them out to be rednecks. Like, they have gay people in their family. They're totally accepting of it in the majority of cases. There are some people who are bonkers and need to, like, join the 21st century, but majority of people are not anti-gay in the South. There are some who are. 
but it's not the majority, but we paint the, them as all one redneck group that's, you know, anti. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that's... I think that's a strength of America, where I think we have the best culture in terms of just getting the best of everyone in the world in, in, in being here. I know that we're tight on time here. So yeah. um, we had a other couple of cus, uh, audience questions, but I think we'll have to leave it for next time. Part two? Yeah, part two. Part two. Give me one uh, more question. I'll do one more. Yeah, Which I mean, one's I your favorite I, question uh, well, that we didn't get to? I mean, I think it's like, what's, what's next on you? So you have the master plan of, you know, how, you're going to be the best investor, period, 30-year trajectory. What's the rest of 2018, 2019 look for you? What can we look out for? Um, whew, what can we look out for? We know there's a book. I'm going to do another book, but read Angel um, or listen to it, especially if you're a founder. A lot of founders thought, oh, it's a book for angel investors. And it is, but it's also a way to reverse engineer your right. funding and understand how investors you know, pick which businesses to fund yeah. and which ones not to fund. So it's definitely worth reading as an uh, entrepreneur. We are, um, our incubator is accelerating in the number of classes. So I'm looking for companies in the Goldilocks zone. Goldilocks zone for us, you haven't done your Series A yet, but you have a product in market with some traction. So not too hot, not too cold. And then the big thing that's happened recently is jasonsyndicate.com has 2,500 members. The last deal we did, we were able to do, I think, 2.2 or $2.4 million dollars. So that makes us like a Series A investor. So yeah. now we're co-leading Series A's with Series A firms, not just angel investing. We have an incubator. We do seed rounds, but we're also going to be doing more and more co-leading of Series A's, so which is something up. new. Yeah. And the reason this is possible is Trump did something right, or he didn't stop something right that started before him and is probably more accurate, which the a is- A plus, right? The Reg A plus or the Reg Well, B? not put a, putting aside Reg A okay. plus- the number of syndicate members in a $10 million or smaller deal went from 99 in this LLC structure called an SPV, special pressure, to 250. Mm. That means instead of just having 99 people invest in Cafe X or Blockable and filling up and doing a 500K or a million dollar round, now we can go 250. So if 250 people put 5K in each, it's all of a sudden it's 1.25 million, right? Yeah. And so that's changing everything. And then you may have read the SEC is going to change or they're going to add to the accredited investor definition. So there'll be accredited investors who make 200,000 plus a year. Like a million in assets. A million in assets outside of their home yeah. or a million in assets outside of their home. And they're going to come up with essentially what is sophisticated, hmm. which means either through life experience or education, you don't meet the financial criteria, but you meet those. So it could be maybe a master's in business or you worked as a an accountant or you took a course on financial literacy because right now the trust fund kid we talked about earlier would be accredited right but he has no experience he's and on, an he's economics professor teaching mba students in a city that paid under 200,000 a year would be unaccredited right that makes no sense that the trust fund kid or the lottery ticket winner is more sophisticated than the professor or somebody who took a course. So that's going to be, it's. I think that's passed as law, I believe, mm. is my understanding. And that, I could be wrong, but now the SEC has to figure out how to deploy that intelligently. And the SEC really has to take their time and do this right, but I hope they do it quickly, um, or I hope they do it as efficiently as possible, I should say, not right. quickly. Um, because they're up against people doing I ICOs that make no logical sense. Yeah, the crypto thing's another topic. We yeah, they're doing into. ICOs where people are sending money to wallets, not even bank accounts, right. to people they don't know in places in the world where they could be ISIS or, you know, North Korea. Who knows? It's slowing down now. Like all the oh, it's been stopped because yeah. people are being arrested right. because they're selling Chuck E. Cheese tokens. To unaccredited investors. To unaccredited investors and like saying it's not a security. Right. And the person buying it is saying, I'm buying it because I want it to go up in value and I want to get a thousand to one. Right. So if the person buying it believes it's a security and you believe it's a utility, the SEC will side with what the person buying it yeah. thinks, not what yeah. you believe. So that's been worked out, I yeah. think. Now people are scared to death. Doing these ICOs is more expensive and more risky than just going with accredited yeah. investors. Yeah. So if you're a founder, don't be stupid. I'll add one last question. So I think because of our human performance audience here, We've talked a little bit about keto, ketosis, fasting. Yeah. What's your sort of 
protocol you, you do personally. I know that I see you post big oh. cum hock steaks every now and then. Yeah, like, you gotta, you gotta. It's get- something. It's the one piece of my life I have to solve this year. Okay, because. I was a marathon runner, six degree black belt in Taekwondo, and was working out like a maniac through my, you know, late 30s. But then yeah. in my 40s, I had kids and stopped. Okay. And I went from 165 pounds to 213 at the peak. Okay. So a massive <laughs> 50 pound swing almost, yeah. which is crazy. And yeah. now I've lost half of that, but I still have half to go. I've been experimenting with a little bit of the intermittent fasting. That seems yeah. to work well for me. Ketosis and just the Atkins diet, low carb diet works really well yeah. for me. And I just built a home gym. So I'm trying to make it more of a routine. I wake up, I work out. But it, in, in in all honesty and candidly, it's like the one part of my personal life I just have not been able to get under control. I got my gambling under control, my addictive personality. <laughs> I channeled that into investing. It's like a much healthier. And we're playing poker where, yeah. you know, I'm, you know, become a very good player. Not great, but very good. And I only play in games where I'm not the worst I'm in the yeah. top half of the I mean, players. If you're in the regular game with Phil Hellmuth, you got some good. Well, I'm in. always behind him, but yeah. you know, and I'll always be a loser to him. But in my personal poker game, I'm right in the middle of the pack. I would yeah. say, um, and I no longer play in games where I'm the eighth or ninth best player. I only right. play if I'm the fifth or sixth right. best player at the table. So at least I have an equal money chance of winning. Right. I just won't put myself in those situations mm-hmm. anymore. I used to. Um, so yeah, it's one thing I got to get going. That's why I've been drinking your product, <laughs> which tastes horrible, but, but it's incredibly effective. Okay, there you go. Yeah, you have to get the flavor set up. But I think people like it not tasting good. It makes it more like, <laughs> it makes it feel like it works. Yeah. If I, I dump I, it into a Perrier, would it still work or no? It works. Okay. So people have been mixing with cold brew coffee. I mean, oh, there's perfect. been like a little community where people are yeah, tinkering around. Yeah, that's what around. you got to do. And you got to get the price down. When is this going to be like five bucks a bottle? Working on it. Working on How it. How long? Working. Two years? Five so, bucks a bottle is what it needs to hit. It has so, to be the okay, cost no, of I mean, two, I'll, yeah, I'll just give, two Gatorades. Yeah, so we're looking at, so we did a three metric ton run. Uh-huh. And we're looking to do a 30 metric ton run very shortly. And get you and down. That will get us down at least by around half. So that's something Perfect. that we're working on. Yeah. Oh, so if you just keep doing larger and larger quantities, it'll go down. Yeah, theoretical yield is a little bit more expensive than sugar. So, so what you need to do then is just have people do a pre-order and do a, like a, an Elon Musk style Model Three kind Kickstarter. Of, yeah, I mean, if you just say buy a year's worth, give us five thousand dollars or give us two thousand dollars, you might get a hundred people to do it. All right, do you want to be number one? No, <laughs> no, not you get the flavor right. Okay. No, maybe. I mean, maybe I should. I, I'm, I, I uh, have been working on. Trying to understand this better. I'm okay. you're the expert, I'm the neophyte, but all right. You know, that, that's what something you can teach me. Yeah. Let's talk about that offline. All right. Thanks so much, Jason. Appreciate My pleasure. That.